Have you noticed our theme here today? It's all about Jesus, folks. It's about, all about Him. The Word of God from Genesis to Revelation speaks of Jesus Christ. Uh, he is the one that uh, woke us up this, mor this morning. He is the one that died on the cross for our sins. He is the one that rose from the dead and it gives us eternal life. He is the one that's coming back again. And folks, uh, it's been a great study. I just cannot tell you how much I have enjoyed studying it. Uh, it does take time, I will say right now. Uh, I've never taught a book and studied any more than I have uh, for the series in Revelation. Uh, there's so, many, so much symbolism, so many ideas, so many opinions out there, and uh, we did our best to uh, interpretate Scripture the way I believe it needs to be done. Uh, in your bulletin, you have an overview. And again, there's, gosh, I've probably seen 10 to 12 overviews, different kinds, different places. Not everybody here will agree with this one, okay? And that's okay. I, I totally understand that. Uh, but the gist of uh, what we studied is here. And I just wanted to give you that. Uh, that way you can file it and uh, so many of you have made just wonderful comments. Uh, you have encouraged me in the faith. Uh, there are preachers that will just not teach the book of Revelation. And folks, uh, we as ministers need to teach the whole Bible from Genesis to Revelation. And, you know, we, we never make mistakes on purpose, uh, but we do Scripture as uh, well as we possibly can, being inspired by the Holy Spirit. Today I want to just sum this all up. I call it Revelation Summary. Revelation Summary. And uh, if you have a bulletin and want to follow along with us, uh, let me give you the outline. Number one, the fall of mankind. We need to go all the way back to Genesis uh, to do an overview. And we'll share that scripture with you. Uh, and truthfully, it is, you know, from Genesis to Revelation, makes a, a circle all the way around. It began in the Garden of Eden in a perfect utopia, and folks, it's going to end in a perfect place called heaven. Amen. And we praise God for that. Number two, the purpose of Jesus. The purpose of Jesus. Folks, he came for a purpose. He came for a reason. And number three, the final judgment. There's people that don't believe the Bible. There are people that don't believe that they are going to stand before God. But I am telling you, as a minister of the gospel, my job is to remind you the truth of Scripture. Folks, it's Scripture that leads us. It is Scripture that changes us. It is Scripture that guides us in our everyday living. And we are going to show you uh, what the Bible says about that. And then I wrote r little subtopics off of that. The fall of mankind, where it all began. The purpose of Jesus, why Jesus came. And the final ju judgment, what will the end look like? So we're going to be all over uh, the Bible today. And I want you to start in John chapter 10, 10. John 10, 10. And you have to understand when Lucifer, all right, got kicked out of heaven, his whole job and took one third of the demons with him is to harass and lie to Christians and to keep people, blind people, to the truth of the scripture. There's this battle going on, and we see it now, and it's called good and evil. And it seems like evil is, is winning the battle. Now, folks, they may win a battle or two, but I'm telling you, God wins the war. God is more powerful. God has more strength. God is in control of everything in our lives. He didn't wake up this morning and say, huh, what's going on down there? He knows it, and he's in control, and things are going to work out, and I want you to know that. But in John 10:10, 10, 10, Jesus is speaking. And he calls him the thief. Why the thief? Well, I believe the thief does not come except to steal, kill, and destroy. None of those are good things. What does he steal? He steals our peace. What does he kill? He kills our joy. And what does he like to destroy? Our testimony. So he's out there. He is alive. He is well. The demonic forces are, are well, and, and they are powerful.
powerful, but folks, they are not almighty. Almighty God is in control. So the thief uh, does not come except to steal, kill, and destroy. And this is Jesus' words. I have come that they may have life. Oh, folks, uh, you know, predestination when God chose us, we have life in Jesus. And that they may have it more abundantly. (laughs) And I I use this frequently. But, you know, when I talk to people, and and Christians especially, how you doing? Well, okay. How you doing? Well, I'm treading water. How you doing? No, not so good, preacher. And I know we have our bad days, okay? But don't make a bad day a bad month. And don't make a bad month a bad year. How you doing? I am saved. I'm doing good. How you doing? I'm going to heaven. Are you going to? There are ways that we can show the world that we do not live a defeated life. We are strong in Christ Jesus. Now go to Genesis 2. Genesis chapter 2, and we know chapter 1, in the beginning. And folks, uh, it's not evolution. It's not the bang theory, okay? It is God creating the heavens and the earth. With his voice, with his power, he created everything that we see. And then down in verse, chapter 2, verse 4, I want to pick up there. In, in the first part of 2, is he, you know, he had rested from uh, all that he had done. But for the time, let's look at 4. Uh, chapter 2, verse 4. This is the history of the heavens and the earth when they were created. In that day, the Lord God made earth and heaven before any plant of the field was in the earth and before any herb was in the field had grown. For the Lord God had not caused it to rain on the earth. There was no man to till the ground, but a mist went up from the earth and watered the whole face of the earth. Now, verse 7 is a key. And the Lord God formed man from the dust of the ground. How did he do it? Hey, folks, our God can do anything. We are dust. And, you know, I'm not trying to be morbid here, but if your body lays in a, in a casket long enough, it's going to go back to dust anyway. But here's the key. And breathe into his nostrils the breath of life. Folks, you are walking and breathing because of God. He created you. Psalms 139 says you were wonderfully, you were beautifully created. So life begins, and and folks, we believe this with all our hearts, life begins at conception. It begins at conception. And man has become a living being. Now look at verse 9. And out of the ground the Lord made every tree grow that is pleasant to the sight and good for food. The tree of life was also in the midst of the garden, and the tree of knowledge is of good and evil. And we have seen the tree of life in heaven. In heaven, folks, it's speaking of salvation there. It is speaking of life there. And then we have the tree of knowledge of good and evil. And this is what we'll be talking about in uh, chapter 3. In chapter 3. And when you see, uh, you know, that... Adam and Eve disobeyed God. You know, not obeying God brought death to mankind. Before that, they weren't going to die. They had one thing, one thing God told them not to do. And I'm telling you, what did they do? They did the wrong thing, folks. They made the wrong choice. And we have been in a broken world ever since. Now skip down to verse 15. And the Lord God took man and put him in the garden of Eden to tend it and to keep it. And the Lord God commanded the man saying, of every tree of the garden you may freely eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat, for in the day that you eat it you shall surely die. God warned Adam and Eve. And we know what happened there. Look at chapter 3. Now the serpent was more cunning than any beast of the field which the Lord God made. And he said to the woman, has God indeed uh, said you shall not eat of every tree of the garden? There's two things Satan does to mankind. 
He likes to question God. He likes to question God. Did God really say that? And you know what else he does? He likes to put doubt in our minds. And that's what is going on in these first seven verses. Has God indeed said, you shall not eat of every tree of the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, and by the way, if the serpent is hanging around and you know it is an evil spirit, my advice to you is do not converse with it. Rebuke it in the name of Jesus and go on. Okay? Because when that conversation starts, Satan makes wrong right and right wrong. So beware. We may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, you shall not eat it, nor shall you touch it, lest you die. Eve knew what God had said. Then the serpent said to the woman, you will not surely die, for God knows that in the day that you eat it, your eyes will be open and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. Is that not like mankind? We are not satisfied with who we are. We are not satisfied with, with what God has given us many times. He told them, he tempted them with, hey, and you think about it, they were in a perfect place, all right? They had trees, they had fruit to eat, it was perfect, there was no thorns, there was, you know, nothing. It was a perfect place, but yet Satan talked them into this. Satan lied. As a matter of fact, John 8, uh, 44 says, he is the father of lies, the father of lies. You shall surely not die, for God knows that in the day you eat it, your eyes will be open. So the woman saw the tree was for good, good for food, that it was pleasant to the eyes, and a tree desirable to make one wise. She took of its fruit and ate, and she gave it to her husband with her, and he ate. Then the eyes of both of them were open, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves coverings. And we don't have time to go down through uh, the rest of that, but literally, let me just sum it up in this. They were hiding because they knew they had done something wrong. They had broken God's law. They are hiding from God, which is hilarious, like God's not going to find them, okay? And then what they start doing, they started blaming one another. First, Adam said, well, if you hadn't gave me Eve, this wouldn't be a problem, Okay? And then she, she blamed it on the serpent, and it just went down through there. And the bottom line is, folks, everything changed that day. Everything. Now there was sin. Now there, there was broken relationship with God. Jesus hadn't even come yet. But all through the Old Testament, all through history, and you'll see up right to where Jesus came in, the whole issue was making God Lord of your life, believing God by faith and trusting. And here's the deal, folks. They had to trust in something that had not happened yet. We look back at the cross and we know it happened. Can you imagine uh, being in the Old Testament and somebody just tells you this is going to happen? But the whole gist of this is, since that time, God was trying to get man's attention to know, I'm sending my son. Y'all blew it, okay? We are all sinners. Everyone has sinned. Everyone has fallen short of the glory of God. So we're all in the same boat. But what he does all through the Old Testament and through the New Testament is point people to Jesus. My son's coming. My son's going to be perfect. My son's going to live a perfect life. My son's going to uh, die on a cross for your sins. His blood is going to pay for your sins. And you can see it all through uh, uh, the Old Testament. So we see the fall of mankind, and God did something about it. Listen to me, folks. God loves you. He loves you. He does not want you to spend an eternity in hell. And folks, hell 
uh, was it made? If you look at it, it was made for de- the demons, the devil and the demons. We studied that in Revelation. But folks, when man sinned, he gave us a choice. God, let me tell you, has never sent anyone to hell. Never. God has not predestined anyone to be in hell. I've heard this, oh, he's been bad since he has been born. Well, folks, we've all been bad since we've been born. Okay? You tell a three-year-old not to touch something. (laughs) Don't touch my stereo. Don't touch my phone. Don't touch. And they just look at you and laugh. We have a sin nature. But God so loved us that he sent his only begotten son to die for us. That is what is the Old Testament pointed towards Jesus. And of course, the New Testament is Scripture on Jesus. And by the way, I meant to say this at the first, uh, but I'm going to do some topical preaching in the month of June and July. And then in August, I am going to start. I, I was torn in between the two. Just, it, it took me two or three weeks uh, to figure it out. Uh, Matthew and Luke... And this past week, God told me to begin in Matthew and preach expository through the book of uh, Matthew. So that's what I'm going to do. So we see the fall of mankind. Number two, we see the purpose of Jesus. All right, folks, here's where it gets good. That's a sad story, the fall of mankind, but it's truth from the Word of God. Look at Luke 19, verse 10. Just one verse. Luke 19, verse 10. Uh, For the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which is lost. What is the context of that? That was Zacchaeus. Zacchaeus was a wee little man. Remember, you know, in Bible school and you sang that song? Well, he said, come to my house. Why did he go to his house? Because he needed to be saved. And so that is Jesus' purpose in your life. He uses situations in your life to to get you on your knees and make you realize you need Jesus. He makes you realize sometimes, all right, that that is the only way, the only way, uh, you you know, you're going to survive is with Jesus. So his purpose was to come and save the lost. Now look at Romans 10. Romans 10. Romans 10 verse 9. That if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Confession is confessing our sins. Repentance is repenting of our sins. Repentance is a change of mind and a change of actions. We start making the right choices because Jesus Christ, through the Holy Spirit, is in our life. So if we will be saved, we use words like that. If we will become a Christian, if we will surrender everything to Jesus Christ, he can save you. You have a will. Some kids have a strong will. Some adults have a strong will. But folks, we have to learn to to turn that will over to God and say, God, I'm going to follow you. Jesus, I'm going to follow you. I'm going to serve you the rest of your life. Look at verse 10. And with the heart one believes unto righteousness in the mouth, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. And folks, that's what the Gospels have done. When we walk through the Gospels, you'll see red letters everywhere, and Jesus is teaching them and teaching them, I come that you may have life and have life more abundantly. He's come to save the world, is what it's talking about, even though the whole world's not going to be saved. There are many people uh, that turn down Jesus' invitation. There's many people that don't believe the Word of God is His Holy Scripture. There are many people that have, have, you know, God has, uh, you know, put situations in their life trying to get them towards Jesus, but they have ignored the invitation of Jesus. Verse 10, for with the heart one believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made into salvation. And folks, that confession... And and that repentance is uh, praying. It is praying to God 
It's telling God that you can't get to heaven by yourself. You can't go on good works. You can't be good enough. You can't clean up enough. You can't be holy enough to go on your own. We need the blood of Jesus Christ to cover our sins. And we need to become Christians. We need to become uh, saved is what he is saying there. Now here's the kicker. Look at verse 13. For whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Who is whoever? Whoever is whoever, folks. I don't care if you're black, white, Mexican, Chinese. You just go through the whole list. God doesn't look at the outside of people, folks. God looks on the heart. And God's will is for everyone to be saved. But not everyone's going to be saved. We have to make a choice. You realize today you made... Already you've made at least two choices. Well, more than that. You chose to get up. Hopefully you chose to clean up a little. (laughs) And then you chose to come to church. I don't think you're here by accident, folks. It was a choice. You chose to come to the Lord's house on the Lord's day. And folks, the greatest decision that could be made this day is for a sinner to turn their life over to Jesus Christ and choose Jesus. The greatest choice. 2 Peter 3. 2 Peter 3. Go with me there. God is so plain in his writing. God is so plain in his word. Look at verse 8. 2 Peter 3, 8. But beloved, do not forget this one thing that with, uh, with the Lord one day is a thousand years, and a thousand years is one day. And even the agnostics t- sometimes say, hey, didn't he tell the disciples he is coming soon? Well, folks, it's been 2,000 years. But to God, hey, time is not going to matter in heaven, folks. To God, it was two days. Two days, all right? Only God knows when he's coming. He knows the date. He could tell you the date if he chose to tell us, but the Bible says nobody's going to know. It's going to be a surprise. That's why the Bible tells us to be ready. Be ready. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some count slackness, but is long-suffering towards us, not willing that any should perish, but all should come to repentance. You know why he hasn't come? Because that last person hasn't been saved yet. And you know what? Nobody knows but God and Jesus who that last person is. You have come here this day, not by accident. This could be your opportunity to be saved. Verse 10, but the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, which the heavens will pass away with great noise, and the elements will melt with fervent heat. Both the earth and the works that are in them will be burned up. We've already talked about the tribulation period. Therefore, since all these things will be dissolved, what manner of persons you ought to be in holy conduct and godliness, looking for the hastening of the coming of the days. Did you see what that said? We as Christians need to live Christian lives. And not only do we need to live holy lives, When we get a chance to share the Word of God and the gospel with Jesus with others, we need to do that also. Why? Because we could be hastening. If we will get busy winning folks to Christ, that we will get closer to the rapture of the church. That's what this verse means. We have a say in it. And that is important because of which the heavens will dissolve, being on fire, and the elements will melt with uh, fervent heat. Nevertheless, we, according to his promise, look for the new heavens and the new earth, which is in where, which righteousness dwells. Oh, folks, we've seen the new heaven. We've seen the new earth uh, in our study and revelation, and it's going to be perfect. It's going to be amazing. It's going to be incredible. It's going to be like nothing we've ever seen in our life. So as Ted saying this morning, come, 
Come to the water. Come to the well. Come to Jesus before it's eternally too late. So we see the fall of mankind, the purpose of Jesus, and the final judgment. 2 Corinthians. Look at 2 Corinthians 5. 2 Corinthians 5, verse 10 and 11. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. What does the word must mean? No options, folks. You can say, well, I don't believe it. You're going to be there anyway. All right? You may not want to go. All right? <laughs> I remember when I was young, I, I seen young you know, folks, and even with my own father, I got to be about 14, and I said, Dad, I don't want to go to church today. He said, would you like to live another day? <laughs> my dad didn't play, all right? He smacked you, and then we talked about it, all right? All right? I'm serious. He was a disciplinarian. Folks, I am telling you, we all must appear before the judgment seat of Christ that each one may receive the things done in the body. We talked about that last week according to what he has done, whether good or bad, knowing therefore the terror of the Lord, we persuade men. But we are well known to God, and I trust we are well known in our consciences. Two words there, knowing, we know, and the terror of the Lord. Oh, folks, I'm telling you, and you don't want to be at the white throne judgment. You do not want to land at the white throne judgment. You have just, uh, you know, condemned your life. If you show up at the white throne judgment, you have messed up big time. There's no appeals. There's no argument. There's no lawyer going to be there for you. You're not getting away with that according to God's holy word. Then Matthew 25, just a couple of more scriptures. Matthew 25. Verse 31, when the Son of Man comes in His glory, oh, folks, it's going to be glory. Man, I, I look to the eastern sky every now and then. And the other day I was coming into work, and when I was coming into work, there were clouds everywhere. And I'm telling you, this happened. I come over the hill, where the ga and it's been about a month ago, where the gas station is there. And if when I looked at the church, the sun was shining on our church. I thought, oh my goodness. Folks, the sun is always shining at church. Always. Always. We may go through a lot. We may have hardship. We may have bad news. Okay, we may have things that happen in our life. But the sun is shining in God's kingdom. When the Son of Man comes in glory and with all the holy angels with him, and he sit on the throne with his glory. All the nations will be gathered before him, and he will separate them from another as a shepherd divides his sheep from the goats. And we know a sheep is not a goat. I don't want to get into the makeup of all that. The, let me simplify it for you folks. The sheep are God's chosen people. The sheep are the ones that invited Jesus Christ into their life. The sheep is the one uh, that put their faith and their trust in Jesus. And the goats are ones who have denied him, saying, yeah, I probably need to do that sometime, but I'm not going to do it now. And he will set the sheep on his right hand, but the goats on the left. Then the king will say to those on his right hand, come, you blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For when I was hungry, you gave me food. When I was thirsty, you gave me drink. I was a stranger and you took me in. I was naked and you clothed me. I was sick and you visited me. I was in prison and you came to me. And folks, I just want to give one warning here on this verse. That doesn't mean because you do good things, you're going to heaven. Okay? You are saved by the blood of Jesus Christ. You do good works because you are a Christian. There needs to be fruit in your life. These things should happen in your life. Verse 37, and the righteous will answer him saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry or, or see you thirsty or give you to drink? What are they saying? We didn't know it was that important. We, you know, you're kind of surprising us. You caught us off guard. 
And what I'm saying is they didn't do it because they had to do it. They did it because they wanted to do it, because the Holy Spirit was in them. Because when we do good things to people, they take notice. They take notice. And we can share the gospel, and we can tell them why we're doing it. We're doing this in the name of Jesus. Verse 38, and when did we see a stranger and take you in or naked and clothe you? Or when did we see you sick or in prison and come to you? And the king will answer and say to them, Assuredly, I say unto you, inasmuch as you did it unto the least of these, my brethren, you did it unto me. Well, folks, the Christian should all be about giving themselves away. The Christian should be about showing the glory of God in Jesus. The Christian should be about ministry, ministry, helping others. In verse 41, then he will also say to them on the left hand, depart from me, you cursed into an everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. Remember what I said earlier, for I was hungry and you gave me no food. I was thirsty and you gave me no drink. I was a stranger and you did not take me in. You did not clothe me sick and in prison. You did not visit me. And you can be a good person okay, and not know Jesus Christ. It takes a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. Then they will also answer him, say, Lord, uh, when did we see you hungry or thirsty or stranger or naked or sick or in prison and did not minister to you? Then he will answer to them and say, assuredly I say it in you, inasmuch as you did not do it and to the least of these, you did not do it to me. Well, folks, you know, doing something good does not mean you're a Christian. Being a good person does not mean you're a Christian. It's having the Holy Spirit inside of you. It's loving God with all your heart, your mind, your soul, and your being. And it says, and these will go away into everlasting punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. Just as I said, the tree, the tree of life, if you obey it, folks, if you obey, you will be saved. I said disobedience brought death into the world when we talked about a Genesis. And obedience to a Christian means the blessings of God in your life. Folks, don't you want to be blessed? Don't you want to talk about Jesus and the name of Jesus and who Jesus is? Obedience is a blessing, and disobedience is judgment. Punishment forever and ever and ever. Ephesians 5, and I close. Ephesians 5, verse 15. See then that you walk circumspectly, okay? Don't just talk the game. Walk with Jesus. Show Jesus is in your life. Be nice to someone be nice to someone uh, who is not nice to you. We're going to get into that, folks, in Matthew chapter 5. He blows people away on the Sermon on the Mount. I'm telling you, blows them away. See that you walk not circumcisely as fools, but as wise, redeeming the time because the days are evil. I don't believe there's a soul here that would not agree with this statement. Our days are evil. It's evil. And folks, what God is looking for, he's looking for Christians to stand up and be counted, to stand out and share the gospel with others, to invite people to church, to use their gifts for the glory of God, to use their talents for the glory of God. And today, once again, everyone here has to make a choice. Am I going to obey the Holy Spirit, or I'm just going to sit here and think, oh, I'll do it another time. Oh, folks, if you don't know Jesus, please come to Jesus. Father, thank you for this day. God, I thank you for your word, and God, I thank you for the study of Revelation. It is so true. It is yes, and it is amen. And God, my prayer, 
my earnest prayer is if there's someone here that does not have a personal relationship with Jesus, that does not ask for the forgiveness of their sins, has not put their faith and trust in Jesus Christ, has not put their faith in the resurrection of Jesus Christ, God, I pray that today would be the day. God, it'd be the greatest decision they'd ever make in their life. Hands down, it would be. So God, I pray for a salvation this day. And God, I pray for the Christian. Man, we don't have a lot of time left. We need to redeem the times. I truly believe there are folks that need to rededicate their life to Christ. They can come and they can kneel at this author, altar and just talk to you. Or they can talk to one of us and we will pray with them. Others come for baptism. Even others may want to come for church membership. They know who we are. They know what we teach. They know what we're about. And so God, this is your church. This is your invitation. I pray with you, you do with it what you choose. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Would you stand on to your feet and would you come?